Our next speaker is Irene Chen, um, who is a talented student in the clinical, a PhD student in the clinical machine learning group. Irene. All right, testing, you can hear me. Testing, you can see the slides. Yes, we well. can. All right, thank you so much. Um, I am incredibly honored to be speaking today. Um, and uh, I want to thank my all of my collaborators, without whom this research would definitely not be possible. Um, but uh, let's take it away. So as many of you know, um, machine learning has great promise for healthcare. I would say that there are many promising results. And as many people have highlighted already today, um, there is room for improvement. But as a, as a quick recap, um, these days, powered by large observational clinical data sets, um, we have found that models on well-scoped tasks can beat human experts. So these are medical practitioners on um, defined tasks, particularly medical imaging, actually, we are able to match or exceed human performance. Um, the regulation around these models is evolving. Uh, currently, as the FDA is trying to figure out what algorithms should be approved, how should we evaluate them, especially as these models and the data sets on which they're being enacted and trained and the patients that they're being used for um, keep changing. Practically, what that might mean is that you might enter the hospital and their, your doctor may use a machine learning algorithm to inform the care that you would get. Um, this algorithm has been trained on observational data that is collected based on doctors who've practiced on these patients based on the medical knowledge that they've learned, um, how they were treated, and then the outcomes are then recorded uh, as they relate to clinical care. And the algorithm is trained on all of this information. The doctor may then take those scores into account and any algorithmic output is uh, sort of tracked and, and the doctor uses all of that information to determine patient care. The problem that right now that we're finding is that these algorithms aren't exactly um, the most uh, fair or unbiased, as my people would say. Um, and although the algorithms themselves may be inscrutable, inscrutable, particularly medical imaging tasks, it's really hard to break open a neural net and see what's going on. Although, uh, you know, one of the speakers earlier mentioned interpretability, but a lot of these algorithms are inscrutable. So what we are getting more insight into, however, is all the ways that bias may manifest as a result of using these algorithms. As two examples, um, which actually well, have been mentioned before. Um, one is that dermatology data sets that have been used to train deep learning algorithms that can exceed these humans, you know, these specialists performance, we find that they're actually not representative of the patient population. And in fact, they're overwhelmingly featuring fair skin patients as opposed to the wide spectrum of skin colors that we might expect. And then in another example, um, algorithms that allocate resources, specifically care management programs that may predict a patient's health need um, for the next year and then allocate resources accordingly. Uh, they, these algorithms have been shown to feature racial bias because it's um, trained on the cost. So health need, in this case, they use cost as a proxy as opposed to a physiological measurement that might be closer to um, the patient's actual experience. Often, and, and many of you may have experienced this yourself, the reason that we find out about these biases is that an algorithm has already been deployed or is widely used or is considered complete or at least willing and um, close enough to be used. And now some intrepid researcher has gone back and found out, oh wait, there's actually some, some bias going on, um, maybe by looking at different patient subpopulations. Today, I wanna to talk about the entire model development pipeline. So bias audits, as I refer to them, these, uh, this idea that we can take up an algorithm and figure out if there's bias in it are really only one piece, really the end of a very long model development pipeline. Um, a lot of our speakers today have brought in this fact that these questions of ethics and justice actually set on, sit on a web of other disciplines, sociologists, anthropologists, policymakers, um, many other disciplines. But today, as a computer scientist, as a person who's really, you know, just really loves math, um, I want to present the sort of walk through this pipeline through the lens of ethics. So this model development pipeline is something that we, many of us may be familiar with. How can we rethink this and bring questions of equity into them? Today, specifically, I want to talk through three projects that tackle this pipeline and answer these questions about, ec uh, about equity. The first one is I want to outline a way to diagnose sources of unfairness. So after you found the bias 
uh, through these audits, what's the next step? How do we fix it? Second, I'd like to talk about inferring access to care. So this is a confounding factor that can be sort of corrupting the algorithm, even though we don't know it. Um, how can we build that in, learn it as a latent variable perhaps? And then lastly, I want to explore um, how we can find appropriate labels. So how do we know we're predicting the right thing in the first place um, for sensitive conditions, for example, domestic violence? All right, uh, let's, so that's that, oh. All right, so the first case study I want to talk about is how to diagnose, uh, diagnose sources on fairness in supervised learning. Um, specifically, this sits, I would say, actually post bias audit, so at the very end, post appointment considerations. As a case study, um, this is one of the very first algorithms I ran as a PhD student, and we were looking at patient mortality in the intensive care unit. So specifically, um, how when a patient comes in, if they stay for 48 hours, we have 48 hours of data for that patient, how can we predict the patient outcome so that we can allocate resources accordingly? Um, what I found when I, when I ran this algorithm actually is that the algorithm that I trained um, had statistically significant differences by patient self-reported race. So what we found is that not all racial groups um, had the same amount of performance for this algorithm, um, leading to great dis dismay since, you know, we had certainly not anticipated um, this occurring. And the question then becomes, what caused these disparities? What's going on? How can we fix this? Um, certainly, we don't want to deploy this algorithm um, now that we've discovered this, this source of bias uh, or this, this kind of bias. At, uh, when we look at fairness, the, the methods that address fairness at the time, and even so today, uh, there's a lot of literature that looks at the balance between accuracy and fairness. And what I mean by that is that we have two groups here, we have A and B, and A has lower error than B. We might say that we could improve the fairness, so the difference between the two groups by making one group worse. Um, and Although not in such an extreme way, a lot of methods look at ways to minimize the, you know, the damage that's done in the name of being able to close this gap. So question, uh, methods like regularization, fairness constraints are looking to that. In the medical setting, this might be unpalatable and potentially unethical. Instead, we wanted to broaden our range of actions. Um, instead of only looking at the model and just making predictions, we can broaden it and actually take a look at the data that's fed in. So this feeds really nicely into Professor Vandry's talk from you know, 10 minutes ago. Um, and I noticed a lot of the questions in Zoom actually go into, well, once we've fixed the model, how do we take into account you know, wider inequities that are going on? One way to decompose this unfairness and take into account the data that we're using itself is actually to examine bias, variance, and noise. So this is a statistical framework that allows you to take error. You know, you know your model's wrong, but why is it wrong? And it may be actually referring to each of these three components. Um, most people, maybe, maybe if the, the model's wrong for one group, you might say, oh, it's because of sample size. There's you know, not enough data, therefore the model is not doing very well. That means maybe one group is much smaller than all the other groups. This would correspond to variance. So variance refers to the amount of error that occurs because of the sample size. However, there might be other factors going on as well. For example, the model class that you use, maybe you're looking at linear models and you should be looking at nonlinear models, might be a bad fit. That would be a bias term. So we're talking about statistical bias here. And then lastly, there's this component called noise, which is irreducible. For, uh, for example, if the measurements are faulty. So infinite data, as much data as you can collect and the most powerful model class, you still couldn't fit it because the data you collect itself might have so much noise in it that you can't do anything else. And that sort of marks the limit of this data set and this model, what you can do. Folks who are more familiar from the statistics crowd um, may actually see, uh, notice some parallels here with aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty, which closely parallel um, bias variance as aleatoric uncertainty and then epistemic uncertainty correlates well with noise. Um, in our paper, we were able to show that you can actually decompose um, this source of unfairness, uh, cost-based unfairness metrics into a difference in bias, a difference in variance, and a difference in noise. Uh, without bringing too much math into this presentation, what that boils down to is that once you identify which component it is, you can actually propose the fix. So as soon as you find the culprit, you can take you know, the million dollar grant that you've gotten and you can put it into the right bucket. 
if you didn't know which which uh, which culprit was, was causing the source of unfairness, you might waste that million dollars, and that would be a pretty bad thing. Um, as one example, we don't have time to get into all three, we can consider variance. So I mentioned that variance refers to whether or not the sample size is um, insufficient to better explain, uh, to better reduce the error. And so one way we can check if it's variance as opposed to bias, statistical bias or noise, is that we can simulate having smaller and smaller amounts of data sets. Um, empirically, we've observed, uh, others have observed that you can actually connect the dots when you simulate smaller and smaller data sets. Um, and this forms an inverse power law, which allows you then to extrapolate what happens um, if you have infinite data. So you, leveraging this mathematical tool, we can definitively say, oh, well, the variance, decreasing the variance would only get us to here. Therefore, it might come from bias and noise instead. So in summary, by using one framework, we can better diagnose sources of unfairness and then act accordingly after discovering this in a bias audit. Um, next, I want to talk about this question of clustering left-censored multivariate time series with disease for disease phenotyping, which roughly relates to how can we bring in access to care? How can we acknowledge the fact that different patients um, might have different access to care? Um, as a reminder, where we sit in the ethical ML pipeline, this fits in more into algorithm development. How can we take these principles of equity and build them right into the algorithm? In the earlier case study, when I said noise, I actually folded a lot of things in there. Maybe an astute audience member might have said, oh, actually, that could include a lot of things. For example, systemic health inequities all contribute to noise in the measurements. Today, we'll refer specifically to disparities in access to care, um, although the other two are quite important. And find me after, we can chat definitely more about that. Specifically, we want to figure out how we can build access to care directly into the algorithm. So we look at one case study, which is disease phenotyping. So for people who are really into healthcare, this may be old hat. Um, a lot of diseases have the same name, but actually manifest very differently. So scientists and clinicians are interested in, dis in discovering how these chronic conditions might develop over time, but it turns out the diseases might be different. So how do we know um, what one person who has heart failure, another person who has heart failure, maybe they're actually different versions of heart failure and better understanding that would be really important. Putting our machine learning hats on, we could use the observational longitudinal data that we have to learn about these different uh, heterogeneous pheno phenotypes of these, of these diseases. The problem is that the data can be hidden from observation and we call that left censoring here. So, for example, if a patient is diagnosed, then we start collecting all their data. They come in for more tests, they get more biomarkers measured, but if they don't come in at a consistent point, maybe some people come in super early because they have great access to care, other people don't, that can be a big problem and we would call that left censorship. Many factors can impact left censorship, for example, access to healthcare. How then can we learn disease phenotyping from all this data? Um, we propose a deep generative model and it models both uh, the alignment and the subtype, so the phenotype, the heterogeneity of the disease, and it learns both jointly um, through this deep generative model process. Um, and without getting into too many details, uh, our experiments show that we were able to outperform you know, synthetic setups and also recover uh, known chronic conditions and their known uh, phenotypes, as well as being robust to model misspecification. So one last uh, case study before we wrap this all up. Um, as one last example, I wanna highlight some newer work um, and specifically we're looking at, uh, so intimate partner violence is a subset of domestic violence, which is defined as the physical, sexual, psychological and, and economic, economic violence that can occur between former or current intimate partners. Um, and when we think about the pipeline, as I mentioned, um, how we define intimate partner violence is actually a pretty big question because of the way that um, data is collected. So taking a step back, uh, intimate partner violence is a urgent widespread public health concern. Um, it's incredibly prevalent according to the UN. Half of all women who are killed globally are killed by their intimate partners or family. Um, in the US, the CDC estimates that one in three women, one in 10 men will experience physical violence, sexual violence, or psychological violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Um, and so this has incredible ramifications and urgency. So machine learning has seen, you know, promise, how could we use it perhaps to tackle this problem? With intimate partner violence, 
one of the key challenges is that patients underreport due to um, mistrust of the healthcare system, due to uh, other questions about economic dependency, many, many factors come into play and they don't come forward. And so the question then becomes, if we want to do early detection, how do we figure out which labels to use? Two options then occur, uh, occur which is one is that you can look at patients who do come forward and see if that is sufficient, or we could actually have radiologists go in and look at all of the x-rays and figure out if the, you know, and provide maybe a more gold standard label or a more standardized label, as opposed to who enters the program for violence prevention. Um, as I mentioned, we have two tasks. One is these self-report labels. So patients who come forward, and at, this is at Brigham and Women's Hospital in downtown Boston, um, people who enter the violence prevention program for domestic violence, um, they, they, this is one type of label versus a control patient. And then as another um, type of label, radiologists, fellowship, fellowship trained emergency radiologists who are specifically signing up for the domestic violence project, um, look at x-ray scans and determine does this person have an injury. We were able to compare then the labels and figure out which model trend on which labels have better performance. Um, and then we are able to determine how early we could actually detect intimate partner violence. So I wanna wrap up real quickly. Um, the pipeline, as you can see, is long. And these are only a few examples of what's going on. But I wanna challenge those in the audience today to think about when you think about machine learning and health, think about where it fits in the pipeline. Professor Badger has already given an excellent example about how to think about data collection um, and how we can sort of enact change throughout the entire machine learning pipeline. Thank you so much. Irene, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, fantastic body of work. There was one, one comment you made, I'll just say parenthetically, you said about that million dollar grant you've gotten. Can you send me a link to the agency that's providing the million dollar grants. Just as a mistake. You know what I know, you'll know, Colin. Um, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> All right, thank you.